Welcome to the EWTN Great Britain podcast with me, your host, Peter Jones. Welcome to the third episode of our Catholic Man UK series. Today I'm with Father Pius of the Norbertines. Father Pius, it's a big fella. <laughs> if the Coen brothers remade Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, I think you should audition. Do you think yeah, so? Think, yeah, yeah, it'd you... be appropriate. I'm from Nottingham, actually. Oh, so yeah. Indeed. Yeah, so I, I could... think you get yeah. in. You, know, you, you wouldn't get in the kind of standard issue <laughs> version, but you'd certainly get in a kind of Coen brothers yeah, style good, version. Yeah. What height? Six? Something? I'm not sure. Six two, I say. I'm not sure. I think you're more than that. I'm Do you six think so? one and I'm oh, looking right. up. Yeah. Father, you've reached a level of minor, minor, minor celebrity oh, among see. Catholics <laughs> because you're the chaplain to the Catholic Man UK the movement or group or yeah. I don't know what it group, is. Group, I think, sounds group. good at the moment. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Father, how do you become a priest? A lot of people will say, don't want to be a priest. No, don't mm-hmm. fancy that. But I think, not equally, but I think there's very fair to say a lot of men will say, do you want to be married and have a family? You'll think, no thanks. Yeah, indeed. Yes, yeah. Nappies, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. No thanks. Yes. Well, I would say that, I certainly say, if you are if you want to become a priest to avoid becoming a father, then you shouldn't be a priest. Is that uh, right? I think so, yes, because being a spiritual father involves many of the same tribulations as being a biological father, and in some sense for a fewer consolations, because you don't have that intimate relationship with a few children, but you have a di- an, an intimate relationship emotionally, but with a number of people, thousands. And if you're a secular priest, it can be across a huge area, in, across an entire diocese. So you should have, a priest should have that desire to be a father quite strongly, I think. I met a guy called John Waters, who's kind of a Catholic thinker over in Ireland. And one of his kind of lines was, look, we're all fathers to the know, nation or the state. And I hadn't really heard those words. And it really it got the hook in me mm. that, or whatever you yes. are, you can a duty to your... And even here, to change the words now, I'm going to feel the yes. patriotic spirit yeah. right up in me. Yeah, indeed. Yes, yeah. I think you're absolutely right. It is the first vocation of man to be a father. And I think that's most obviously fulfilled in biological fathers who then, in looking after their children, become natural fathers. But every man must find a way in which to fulfil the vocation of paternity. If you're a single man, then you need to look to find that through work, through, as you say, through looking after things through the state, or whatever it might be. But you do need, a man does need, to exercise that paternity in order to live his vocation. So go on, Father. Tell us a bit about how you become it. So I come from a a culturally Catholic family, but uh, my family never really practised. I went to Catholic schools, um, and then when I was about 13, I confirmation and I stopped going to Mass, as many young Catholics do. Confirm you're leaving, I think. The sacrament of lapsation, as it's sometimes, that's not for our confirmandi, of course. Um, But then at the age of 17... Um, Well, 16, I started studying religious studies at school A-level, not because I was religious, because I was quite good at it. And then uh, doing that, thinking about philosophy, I decided that I believed in God, but didn't do anything about it. Is this the first time you decided that? Yes, the first time I decided that. That's hilarious. Uh, Yes, yeah. Um, But then when I was 17, I went to see The Passion of the Christ at the cinema. Let me stop you there. What argument got you? You said you did philosophy. So was it an academic conviction? That's an interesting question. So I suppose before that, I had flirted with becoming Russian Orthodox. I went to a Catholic school. One of my best friends at school, he and his family were Russian Orthodox. And I used to go to the Divine Liturgy with them. And in fact, I went to, to on a parish pilgrimage to Lindisfarne, Holy Island, off the coast of Northumbria, isn't it? Um, and so that was, I had a, a sort of religious experience, you might say. I had a, a, that was when I was 15, year 10. I had a feeling of a presence of God. Um, which was quite strong in the moment, but that didn't outwardly change anything in me. And so when it when it came to A levels, I it was in part an academic, intellectual decision that I was not that I'd ever felt like an atheist, but it, I'd never been moved or thought that I had to think about these things in an intellectual way and so as soon as I started to realise that there were huge swathes of people who didn't believe in God, and being um, seeing their arguments it was then that I decided that I did and I was never one to sit on the fence (laughs) you might say so as soon as I realized that there was a decision that needed to be made I think 
I, by the grace of God, I came to see the truth of his existence. So we can say that the, the hook, I always like to say the hook, but the seed, one might say as well, the kind of stomach got yes. you, the kind of thing in your stomach yeah. stayed there, yeah, you say, even though you didn't do much about yeah. it. Yeah, indeed, there was, there was that gut feeling, uh, which as you said in me is quite something, that gut feeling that moved me and then thankfully was also came with an intellectual decision later. conclusion later that I, and then when i saw the film the passion of the christ that was the moment that it became into action that i've had this feeling and i've made this decision now i need to do something about it what about the film got you it was the strong sense that if i believed that this man jesus christ our lord was god then i needed to do something about it i don't know if you've seen the film but there's that moment where he's crucified and then the crucifix falls down face first and i remember being physically shaken by that scene and that was what struck me in particular that this man god died for me and therefore i need to respond to that love that christ shows us on the cross I didn't know at the time, but that when I saw the film, it was actually Holy Saturday. And so I went back to Mass the next day, which of course was Easter Sunday, um, and renewed my baptismal promises at Mass on Easter Sunday, my parish church where I was baptised. And it was actually then that I th th first thought about becoming a priest. Even let's get back into the film there, Father. Yeah. There's, there's a lot here. Just even chatting to him, knowing yeah. you said earlier, canon lawyer. So mm. bright guy. I would say, growing up, you're probably not bowled over by the emotional argument. No, indeed. And, no. and, and the arguments you're saying about yeah. Jesus, that I loved you, that argument had already been put to you mm -hmm. through the confirmation and years yeah, of being yeah. a cultural Catholic. Yes. But is it fair to say it was the, the visual? And we know Mel Gibson, he does like a bit of violence in his movies. That's what kind of tipped a domino, if you like. Indeed. I sometimes describe it to people as the straw that broke the camel's back. So it was, it was a moment, and that was when the decision, as I say, came to the fore, that I felt this, I believed this, and therefore it needed to come about in action. So all of these things came together by the grace of God in that particular moment, and I was brought by him, by God, back to the church, back to Mass. What was the details behind the movie? You'd seen the trailer and you thought, I can't wait to see that, or you thought, not, not a chance. It seemed like a moment in um in world i would say world history but a cultural moment i think so that was probably the first impetus for me to go and to see it i'd heard i think that pope john paul ii had praised the film and being a cultural catholic it seemed like something that one should go to see i went with my mum in fact and so it was a it was a moment that i felt felt i had to take part in i don't think my intentions were specifically or largely religious in going to see it but perhaps more out of curiosity and interest and of course there was some criticism of the film as well and so i wanted again since i'm not one to sit on the fence i think if i'm going to have an opinion on this which i am then i should have some experience of the film and see it often when you hear a conversion there's quite a lot of details specific mm -hmm. to that person's life would you yeah. say it happening on the saturday and easter's the next day looking back do you think all right yeah god he got me here. He done me proper. Indeed, yes. Quite. Um, as I said, I didn't realise realise it was Easter. I guess I must have known since it was school holidays. But it didn't click in me. But absolutely, I see God's hand at work in bringing me back on Easter Sunday. This is a reason we're speaking the day before Palm Sunday of the moment. So we're preparing to celebrate all of these great feasts. And so for that reason, Easter has always had, obviously it's the greatest feast for all Christians, but a particular moment for me, and that's when I came back to the church, came back to Christ. You say you're not a guy to sit on the fence. God finds it hard to work with the lukewarm. Indeed, yes. Yeah, well, you see in the, in the book of Revelation. He reserves where, some strong language. Yeah, indeed, yes. I will spit you out. And I think that it's becoming increasingly more difficult to be a lukewarm Catholic because you will be paired off. There is a sorting of the sheep from the goats, the chaff from the wheat, which I think is good and proper and is being used by God um, so that those who love him will cling to him. And so there are opportunities in this present time of, of crisis um, in the faith and the crisis in humanity that we're experiencing in Western Europe in order to draw and be drawn closer to Christ. So the lukewarm are 
difficult for for um, priests to deal with and it's a lot of our work in fact is with people who are at least in some part and we're all sinners of course but many people who perhaps treat the church a little like a, a shop um, like a, a Tesco experience and we have to as priests not become cynical and realize that there is an absolute power in the sacrament and God can work through these things and absolutely does work through it through these things but to also see that to try and increase the faith in these people in all of us so that they can go from being lukewarm to being fervent and on fire i've come to bring fire to the world christ says would that it were already burning we can all all be lukewarm at times it isn't just about other people it's about us we need the faith to be on fire in us as well from this moment of mel gibson's famous movie kind of a watershed moment in culture in a lot yeah, of ways I think so Becoming a priest, how yes. far off is that? So I get, I was 17, I think, 17 or 18 when I saw the film. And so I, I then went to university and university was very important in my, in my life. I went to Oxford and there was a wonderful Catholic community at Oxford. And it was there that I realized that I could be proud to be Catholic. And there was a wonderful chaplaincy. Monsignor Jeremy Fairhead, who's a priest of Westminster, was the chaplain um, for the first two years. And he inspired many young men to be priests um, and religious. In fact, of my contemporaries, I think I'm right in saying there are 10 of us who are priests. In a nutshell, how do you do it? How do you become a priest? No, h- how'd he do it? That, I, you'd have to ask him. I'm a university chaplain here in Chelmsford at Angley Ruskin, and I'm still to discover the secret. I think food is good (laughs) conviviality fellowship there was a critical mass we would get something between two and three hundred students to the sunday mass which is significant for a for a university chaplaincy and father jeremy was always on hand to provide a forum for catholics to be to discover more about the faith to be proud to be a catholic to learn to grow the devotions not only in mass but how the grace of the mass spills over in eucharistic adoration benediction i remember being particularly impressed by the prayer for england i remember hearing for the first time or one of the first time when i was at university and thinking gosh these people really believe that this country needs to come back to christ and being so impressed by that and having a community of other people there were vocations groups and retreats being able to think and speak with other men my age about thinking about the priesthood had an immense impact. In fact, one of my confreres here in Chelmsford, Father Stephen, was also a student with me at the same time. A lot there as well, Father. I mentioned before about a kind of critical mass is needed for Catholics, certainly in local communities. Yes. I'd be typical of a generation that would go to mass, I'm sure you as well, where even you look around mass and you just weren't really feeling it. There is a delight in meeting your fellow sinner. That spurs you on. You're part of the Catholic Man UK group, Mm -hmm. and there's kind of two dynamics online where there is the online debating, which is necessary. Either the culture is going to call you out, God in your private life is going to call you out, or your fellow Catholics are going to call you out. And no bad thing. If it's done with good manners, congeniality, then I think that's the the ironmonger is uh, testing. But there is also the other side of that physical side you don't get with the internet of you need to meet up. Yes, Frater- physical fraternity yeah. can't be... No substitute. Not substituted, absolutely right. How do you survey the current climate for Catholics? For, for men in particular, because they're the ones really lacking in churches and in the parish. I think that there's a great danger um, amongst Catholics today, and amongst devout Catholics, and the danger of nostalgia, the danger of thinking there was a golden age. Now, there were certainly ages and times where it was easier to be a Catholic, but why should we want that? God has put us here today and has put us here today so that we could be used by him now. And so the, the when I look around, I see, particularly when I've been to events with Catholic Man UK, our annual pilgrimage and conference in particular, I see 30, 40 devout catholic men trying to be 
good, trying to be godly, and that's immensely edifying. Perhaps in ages gone past there were more of the lukewarm, and perhaps if we're seeing these things through God's eyes, we would say that we're blessed in this age. And so I look around and I see many opportunities for evangelization, because out there we're going past the point of cultural Catholicism, where people don't know anything about the Catholic Church at all. Yes, yeah, a fresh harvest, yeah, if you like. Indeed, yeah, 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 they're blank slates. One of my jobs here in the parish is that I um, instruct converts. And so um, I've been privileged to instruct around 40 or 50 people who have come to the faith in the last five years, um, four or five years. And so many men in particular who are coming from no Catholic culture, who are just having an intellectual interest in why, what is the Catholic Church, this organisation, as you might say, that seems to say so many things about sex and life. And we seem to be the only people yeah, taking the, these lines. Exactly. And so why is it to discover more about the Catholic Church? And so, as I say, there are great opportunities in the crisis, and that's what God gives us. Every moment is an opportunity to grow in grace, to share in his divine life. And so we shouldn't be downcast when we look around us. Yes, there are immense problems. There is immense sin in ourselves at, because of original sin. That hasn't changed. In the public square, yes, there are immense immoralities being um, allowed and proposed and mandated by governments in this country and in other countries. And that is evil and it is something that we must confront. But there also is an opportunity for us to confront evil with love so that Christ can be brought to every moment and Christ can be brought by us and particularly by the laity to the public square. The laity needs its priests. But if I might pick up on the sex scandal and all that, hugely damaging. Luke Coppin did the, he was quite honest, review of his time as editor mm. of the Herald and he said, well look, I was kind of quite taken by, I think it was McCarrick and mm. the, is it John Vanier. Yeah, yeah. And his editor scolded him a bit and said, look, don't get sucked in by the cult of a person. I think that's very good advice. John Vianney by day and John Travolta by night <laughs> no. is certainly something to be avoided. What would your take be on building that trust back up? It's on us as Catholics to try and do that and yes. to say to the world, look, we are doing it and this is how you overcome these things because yes. it's not like other institutions don't no. have the same problems. I think honesty is the first thing that's important is to say that these actions are disgusting and abhorrent and evil and when you see particularly when it's clergy and religious who have been abusing children and vulnerable adults you see that how they use the sacraments in order to propagate their perversity and so that fundamentally changes a person's interaction with God and there you can see Satan working in that person and so we should be honest and call out evil absolutely that's what we should do and after that honesty the question is you know, how do we build up trust then we have to remember and ask ourselves and each of us needs to ask ourselves who do we trust put not your trust in princes even if they be princes of the church Put your trust in Jesus Christ. Christ works through human beings and we are sinful and fallible. And that's not an excuse, that's a fact. The laity should absolutely call out evil where they see it. There should be no opportunity or possibility of cover-up. The laity should be absolutely clear that they need to ask difficult questions and clergy too and religious and moving on from that we need to offer up a spiritual response not just a spiritual response but we need each of us to be offering up prayers of reparation because we're all in the body of Christ and so we need to seek spiritually to repair the spiritual damage caused by predators in the priesthood and in the laity through acts of reparation, sacrifices and, and mortifications and masses offered for victims and survivors of abuse as well. And practically we need to make sure that every parish and organisation in the church has stringent safeguarding procedures that are not just written down on paper but that are actually part of the lifeblood of the organisation because if people aren't safe then the gospel cannot be preached. And so absolutely this needs to be part of our calling.
you mentioned there about the reparation. Suffering, certainly charitable suffering, is a huge currency with God. Mm-hmm. It's not something to be avoided. Mm-hmm. A bit like the financial crash, the, the ordinary guy picks up the bill through taxes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would you say, because of justice, because of the offence against God, justice has to be rendered? Is it our part as lay people to pick up that tab? A bit like the taxpayer, mm-hmm. the small guy in the big wide world where more powerful people have caused the problems. Yes. Is that part of our gift or part of our, I don't know, Christian mission? It is, yes. And I, as well as being a gift, it's a privilege to be able to participate in an act of reparation for clergy and lay people who have abused trust, abused others, um, and in a sense, in a different sense, abused everybody. And so we should see that as part of our duty as Christians, lay or clerical. In the Priory here in Chelmsford, we had a public act of reparation a few months ago, it might even been a year ago, just after Pope Francis released a letter encouraging these things. And this was led by the priests, the three priests currently resident in our priory. And so this was a, an important moment when we knelt down before God in the Blessed Sacrament and recited the Psalms of penance um, and penitence and contrition on behalf of the people of God and with the people of God. And so this is a privilege and a duty that we must all take part in. We should not avoid the cross. That's one of the most fundamental lessons of the Christian life. We should seek to be conformed to Christ. It comes back to that, I suppose, that father, whether you've got kids or Absolutely. not, whether you're a priest or not, you pick up that cross. Yes. And you're, you're doing your bit to heal the church, to take yes. it forward. Absolutely. One of the questions is, who is going to do this? Me. That's that's I only I can only control one person's actions. If you lined up Richard Dawkins, Sam, who's his name, Sam Harris, that's it, Dennett, and God rest his soul, Christopher Hitchens. If I sat with them for several hours and said, yeah, yeah, that's all very interesting, very good. I saw the Isaiah passage in a film, a tank film, straight away. One passage from Isaiah. Right, I'm on your team. God gets you like that. That human experience, which involves the soul, which. I find atheism just doesn't have the language for it kind of fiddles around with it indeed yes yeah we are body and spirit and no movement or ideology which just focus on one over the other will ever have currency with humanity in the long run for a time look at communism look at atheism and secularism they will have some currency for a moment but not for a long time because we are body and spirit and when we ignore one or the other then there will be problems we've seen this in the church we've seen this in the world and it can never go on father thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me thank you very much for inviting me to speak god bless